Hi. Hi, Professor. How are you? you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Yes, sir. I hear you and the dog. You can hear the dog? Okay, yeah. That's what counts. <laughs> How are you? Okay. You're For looking... some reason, I wasn't able to pick you up on the other computer. I had technical issues as well. Technology will always fail us at some point, right? Well, as long as you can hear me, this backup computer will work. <laughs> okay. But you're looking good. You know, I, I, I wanted to um, pick up from where we left off a few years ago with the interview, and you just said, make... Remind me. I will, I will. And you made some tremendous uh, remarks and just uh, thought-provoking comments about your visions. And uh, so many had come true, but I did want to ask you, because your beard looks so nice and healthy, and, and is this the first time you've grown the beard out? Because you've always, you know, been clean shaven for so many photos, so many years. What do you? What is it? About a year. Yeah. I was, I was immobilized for a month and for oh. an injury, couldn't shave, and decided just to leave it. <laughs> it looks great. It looks. My, great. my wife liked it. She liked it. <laughs> That's what counts, once again. Well, I wanted to one, just uh, thank you again, Professor Chomsky, um, not only for your time today, I know it's very critical. I know you have a full schedule, uh, but we wanna thank you on behalf of others who aren't here. And uh, thank you on behalf of our ancestors and just for your service, your duty, uh, the work you've continued to do, the soldier of, of education, knowledge and humanity that you've been. And I, I did want to open just to ask you, how, how are you feeling? How is your health and how's life going for you? Making out okay. For my age, I'm perfect. Good, good. You're 91 now, yeah? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm here. I'm here. You, you froze up a little bit. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Seems, uh, okay, you seem to freeze for a second. You as, you as well. We're, we're back. Um, now you you you're you're a ripe young ninety one years now yes. Sorry, I'm not hearing too well. Could you try again? I was th I was saying you're you're a ripe young ninety one years on the planet can now. You hear yeah? Me? yeah, I hear you. I can hear you. You know what? Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Can you hear I'm me? I'm going to try to. Go back to that other computer and see if it works. Okay, I'm with you. Take your time. Yeah, it's a little better. <laughs> okay, take your time. So Professor Chomsky is gonna check the other computer. Having some audio and technological issues right now. while we wait for him, uh, he made some remarkable comments and uh, thought provoking points uh, during our interview in 2016, prior to the election once again, and uh, just had some visionary pronouncements on uh, Donald Trump and the possibilities of him being elected, which of course happened. Uh, talked about political movements and not- nope. Yes, sir. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm, I mean, this this one seems to be working better. Okay. 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 I, I didn't hear the last couple minutes. I was moving from one room to another. I don't know why you can't see me, but I think you just have to enable your camera. But there you are. Oh, okay. That's my wife's. She's my technical assistant. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank God for her being around to help. Um, I was just I was just making light to begin uh, asking you about yourself and just saying you, you've made it. You're, you're a ripe young 91 years and still working away. Yes. Yeah. A couple yeah. months, it'll be 92. <laughs> yeah. Sagittarius. Um, I, want, I wanted to ask you, there was some things we talked about during our last conversation and you mentioned uh, your affection and wanted people to pay attention to many affairs throughout the world, but one was special to your heart, and it's the town of Santa Rita in uh, South Colombia, in South America. How's things going for our people in Santa Rita? 
Well, I'm not in touch, but uh, there's no way to communicate with them really. They, uh, so I don't know, but the situation is pretty bad. The general situation is awful. I mean, there, there's a lot of human rights activists, other activists being murdered. The, uh, the administration is harsh, brutal. Uh, it looks as if the, uh, there are pro peasant protests all over the place, including Calco, so I assume things aren't good there. So is this, <clears throat> would you maybe compare this to um, the protests and democratic movements and other government movements of people in Central America during the 70s and 80s and how, been, how they were repressed and kind of militarily beaten down by authorities? How would you, what would you say? Well, okay, in Colombia, it's been going on since for 70 years. It's uh, other parts of Central America, it's very, so the, uh, um, in Central America itself, the countries were devastated by Reagan's wars after decades of brutal uh, terrorist rule, and they really have not been able to recover. And now on top of it, they're being hit by the effects of climate change. So large parts of Guatemala, for example, which is a, has been a fertile, productive country are now being, uh, have to be taken out of land production, which can't work anymore because of the uh, heating of the environment. And all that's on top of the brutality and harshness of the governments. Uh, one thing that's terrorizing El Salvador is that uh, during the 80s, lots of people just fled and terror came, a lot came to the United States, uh, young kids. But they got absorbed into the gang culture in Los Angeles. And then as soon as the peace treaty so-called was signed, uh, the United States deported them back to El Salvador. These are kids who not, knew nothing except Los Angeles gangs. They brought the gang culture back with them, uh, immediately got involved with the drug cartels, the criminal syndicates, you know, terrorist group in uh, Central America. And of course, with utter cynicism, people who flee from their terror are turned back at the border. I mean, the cynicism is just unspeakable. And there's no, no comment on it. Actually, there was one bright sign, if you like, in Spain. There was a court case just a couple days ago in which one of the uh, chief officials and responsible for the, responsible for the massacre of the uh, Jesuit intellectuals in 1989, one of them was tried by a Spanish court a little late, but uh, he was sentenced, but is suppressed constantly is the fact that the orders for the massacre came directly from the central command. We have the, the document ordering it was in fact printed in the Spanish press, El Mundo, never appeared here. And the, the Central Command was in close contact with the U.S. Embassy always. So it's pretty hard. And in fact, the the murderers themselves were from the Atlacatl Brigade, U.S. trained, U.S. armed brigade. Uh, School of the Americas. Not School of the Americas. Yeah. Just uh, and in fact, I don't know if you know, but the School of the Americas, which has since been renamed because its reputation got too horrendous, but it's still the same school of the Americas. They have uh, what are called talking points, advertising the wonderful things they do. One of the talking points is that the US Army helped defeat liberation theology. 
meaning that the US was at war with the church for 40 years. And finally, in November, in December 1989, we're able to finish up the war by murdering six leading Jesuit intellectuals. That's one of the talking points for the School of the Americas. You're supposed to applaud when you hear them. I'm forgetting his name and I adored him and he was assassinated. They made a film about him. I wanted to say Franco, but I know that's not his name. Um, the, the priest from, uh, I think it was in El Salvador. Uh, he was killed in the church while he was giving mass, I believe. Archbishop uh, Romero. Is, yes. While he was reading mass. Yes. By essentially the same forces. Yes. Romero. Uh, that open kind of the decade was framed by the assassination of Archbishop Romero in 1980, the murder of the Jesuit intellectuals, Father Eo Correa, others at, in 1980, in the end of 1989, a decade of terrorist horrors, not only in El Salvador, but all through Central America from which they may never recover. <clears throat> well, and as a result, it people it, it, it kind of, it, it's very disheartening to note that uh, in the United States, we, either people are clueless or do not care that they are uh, coming in this direction for as a direct result of the damages that we caused there, our, our government and agents caused there in the 80s era, in that era of violence that you're talking about. Is that, would you it, agree with that? It's shocking. When you look at the details, it's almost unspeakable. I mean, in Guatemala, in the Mayan highlands, uh, there was literal genocide. Uh, it was carried. In fact, the general in charge, uh, Rios Montt, was finally brought to trial in Guatemala and condemned, I think, then later amnestied but at least tried and condemned for hideous crimes. While he was carrying out the crimes, Ronald Reagan was praising him as a man totally dedicated to democracy, who's getting a bum rap from the human rights uh, uh, community. I'm quoting. That was while he was committing virtual genocide in the highlands. People are still fleeing from there. Actually, I know a young woman, an amazing story, fled from a Mayan village a couple of years ago. She tried to cross, she was pregnant, tried to cross the border seven times as pregnant, was sent back. Finally, on the seventh try, you know what it's like to cross the border? I mean, I don't have to tell, I live just north of the under Clinton, the technique for barring refugees was to drive them into the most horrifying, difficult, impassable areas of the border, right south of Tucson, where I live. Terrible conditions, brutal heat, no water, impassable conditions. That's where they're driven to flee attacked by border guards, killed, it's uh, awful. Anyhow, she crossed, she, on the seventh try, she was seven months pregnant. She managed to make it to Tucson, where she was picked up by a, a, a there are activist groups in Tucson that actually go into the desert, religious, humanitarian, others try to help refugees. So they were picked up by her, they were, she was sent, they managed to get her sent to Boston where I was living. Uh, she was finally kind of taken care of. And uh, actually she lived with my daughter, still does. And uh, the, the child was born and is fine. But that's the kind of thing that's happening. And uh, you know, the human rights activists here uh, well, I'll just tell you one story from the last month. Okay. You saw, I'm sure, that uh, 
President Trump sent paramilitaries to Portland, Oregon to terrorize the city. Yeah. Uh, he couldn't use the military because they wouldn't have followed orders. That was pretty clear. He tried to use them in Washington. They just refused orders. So he sent paramilitaries, border guards, uh, other federal agents who aren't military. The main group that he sent is called BORTAC. It's the tactical unit of the border patrol, the unit that's trained to be basically trained killers. Mm. In the, if you work through the desert, you can do anything you want. There's no supervision. Mm -hmm. We took BORTAC sent them to Portland to terrorize the city. Uh, then they came back. The first act they carried out when they came back was to break into a small humanitarian aid center set up in the desert, very primitive tents, you know, a cot for people to lie down on if they're half dying and so on. So the Bortak came in, smashed it up, arrested everybody, arrested the enemy, destroyed all the equipment and so on. I mean, that's, I mean, it's happening all the time. You know, it happens to be not here, far from here, so I see it. But, uh, and these are people who are mostly fleeing from US terror and US backed terror. A couple of years ago, the most of the, uh, the caravans that everyone was terribly upset about were coming from Honduras. Why Honduras? Well, because in under Obama, uh, 2013, I think it was, there was a moderately progr progressive president elected in Honduras, Mel Zelaya. Uh, the, the very, the country's owned by rich oligarchs terrorist oligarchs tied up with the international fruit companies backed by the United States. But there was an election and a moderately liberal candidate was elected. He was quickly thrown out by a military coup. That was condemned all over the hemisphere, with one exception, Obama and Clinton. Uh, they refused to condemn it. They refused to call it a military coup, which it was because if it's a military coup, they have to stop military aid under US law. And they wanted to continue providing aid to the torturers and the killers. So they refused to call it a military coup. A couple of months later, there was a fake election by the military regime to elect their own right-wing candidate, condemned everywhere, except by Obama. He and Clinton praised it as a forthcoming step towards democracy. Honduras was turned into the, one of the torture chambers of the hemisphere, of the world in fact, it just got the highest homicide rate in the world shortly after. That's the source of the caravans. That's where people are fleeing from. Not because they love the United States, because life is unlivable thanks to US crimes. In this case, Obama continued, escalated under Trump. You know, I I, I wanted to ask you something, uh, Professor, and, and a few things that you, the dendrites just grow when you speak. And it, when you when you talk about these matters, um, I hear a lot in online debates or just the people's opinion, uninformed opinion, often. Um, they're just like, well, who cares about Honduras? It, but you, you pronounce our, our 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 little brother and sister, our cousin countries. You pronounce them loudly uh, with what happens in El Salvador and Guatemala and Honduras and all over the world. You've done this in Indonesia and East Timor. Why should people? I'm wondering, imploring people to pay attention to this because you've always been a warner. Like you've warned of what's coming for you if you're not paying attention uh, to these pockets. And what you mentioned in our interview in 2016 is you talked about the precipice, that we are heading toward a precipice. 
and this was you were being very generous in stating that Donald Trump could win the presidency. This was in spring. This was way before election season got uh, deep. Uh, but you said, you know, you felt like this would push us closer. And so I'm just wondering, can you can you speak to why uh, people should really pay attention to the, the small nations that you're mentioning? You know, they're significant, but people want to make them insignificant. They're like, they don't matter. That doesn't matter if the United States is flourishing. And we're not, but people well, seem to think so. Let me tell you something hidden about the United States. Something very positive, but secret. Okay. Hide it because propaganda system doesn't want people to know. In the 1980s, the spontaneously in the United States, groups developed right through middle America, the churches in the Midwest, evangelical churches, the farms, rural America, cities everywhere. The most amazing anti-imperialist movement in the whole history of imperialism. Tens of thousands of people spontaneously got organized, not just to protest the atrocities we've been discussing, but to go to the villages and live with the victims, to help them, to provide them with whatever security comes with a white face, uh, to build things that the US and its terrorist forces were destroying. And they stayed on, especially in the church groups. Nothing like this has ever happened before. Uh, like in France, there were groups protesting French atrocities in Algeria, but they didn't go to live in Algerian village. The Vietnam War, huge protest movement. Nobody went to live in a Vietnamese village. I mean, the, the idea just didn't even occur to anyone. In the 1980s, for the first time in hundreds of years of vicious European, very offshoot of Europe, imperialism, first time, tens of thousands of people straight out of the mainstream, no central organization, a little, some church groups, a few others. I mean, that's pretty amazing. It tells you something very important about the country. Of course, it's never reported and discussed. It's not the kind of thing you're supposed to hear. But it happened, and plenty of people know about it. So when you see the reaction to the murder of George Floyd, yeah. it's not coming from nowhere. I mean, there are these significant strains in American society. They're there. They're beaten down. They're suppressed. They're kept quiet. But they're there and they can make a big difference. So when you ask, why should you be concerned about this? Plenty of people are, and good for them. Not in, not in the headlines. No, definitely not. And thank you for answering that. I, I wanted you to take a moment and just look at your clock because I know and respect your schedule, just a little bit I know of it, and I don't want to hold you too far. I know we had technological <laughs> delay, but. Yeah, I'm afraid I have another interview coming up. A couple more minutes. Okay. So let me try to shoot through these really quick. And um, you just touched on George Floyd. Can you briefly speak about what you feel about the efficacy of Black Lives Matter movement? You've spoken about having more than a political stance, but you, when you were talking about Bernie Sanders in 2016, you said it would be great and effective if people use this as a movement, an ongoing movement. But what do you think about Black Lives Matter at this stage? Well, these popular movements make all the difference. I mean, that's real politics. The propaganda system tells you politics means waking up every four years, uh, uh, watching the extravaganza, uh, going to the voting booth, uh, uh, pick one of the candidates that the rich and powerful have selected for you, then go home and stay quiet. That's not politics. Politics means being active constantly, organizing, edu educating, carrying out actions. Every couple of years, the extravaganza comes along, take five minutes, 
decide whether one of them is so horrible that you should vote against him. <laughs> Obvious in this case, and then pick, you know, go into the voting booth and vote against the bad guy. Then proceed with real politics and challenge the guy who won. Okay, that's politics, and it's been happening. The Sanders movement continued; it grew, grew to an enormous popular movement. Black Lives Matter developed, grew, plenty of support in the general population. Quite unusual for a protest movement. It was there doing important things. There were others. Uh, Sunrise Movement, for example, a group of young people uh, working on the most dangerous threat we face, uh, destroying the environment, working hard on this. Now, they got to the point of uh, sitting in in congressional offices, occupying them, including the office of the House Majority Leader, Nancy Pelosi. Uh, they got the support from some of the young uh, representatives who came into office on the Sanders wave, especially Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez supported them. Uh, Ed Markey, a senator from Massachusetts who's been interested in the environment, he joined. They managed to get the Green New Deal on the legislative agenda. That's critically important for survival. It was totally in the margins before. It's now at least on the legislative agenda. Uh, Trump, of course, he wants to destroy the environment, use fossil fuels as much as he can, uh, uh, eliminate regulations, race to the precipice. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the Democrats, it's split. The, uh, the popular pressure from Sanders Sunrise movement, activist movements, did push the Biden program towards a moderately progressive stance on global warming. Uh, the Clintonites who run the party killed it. It was taken off their web page, and now they don't talk about it. So there's a struggle inside the party. And the real politics of the activist movements can make the difference, assuming that is, and it's a, not a clear thing, assuming that Trump can be removed from office. Remember, there's, there's not only a possibility that he might actually win the electoral vote, there's also a strong likelihood that he won't win the electoral vote, but will refuse to leave office. Mm. That's taken very seriously in high places. It's not a crank conspiracy theory. It's talked about all over the most respectable places. In fact, if you want to have a look, there's a letter, important letter, an open letter, must have been about a week ago, written by two uh, highly respected senior military commanders. Uh, one of them was John Nagel, General John Nagel, another I've forgotten his name. They uh, retired, but very respected. They sent an open letter to General Milley, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Chief Military Officer in the country. The letter was reminding him of his constitutional duty to send the military. They recommended the 82nd Airborne Division to send them to Washington to forcefully uh, remove Trump from office if he refuses to go and surrounds himself by the paramilitary groups and armed militias that he's been stimulating around the country. Now, that could be a civil war. It's not far off, a couple of weeks. Now, what's happening in the United States has never happened in the history of parliamentary democracy, hundreds of years. There's a president who's a sociopathic megalomaniac, determined to stay in office, surrounded by psychophants, nothing else. 
uh, heading a party, which is just a bunch of utter cowards, totally lost a shred of integrity, desperately trying to hang on to power any way they can. You can see what's happening with the court appointment. It's a situation which has never arisen before. It's kind of like a small tin pot dictatorship in some third world country where they have a military coup every two years. Yeah. I, I wanted to really respect your time, really. Uh, it, but I, I wanted to see if I could fit a, a joint question in really quick. Um, you mentioned the court appointment situation. And I know people want to know uh, your response and your feelings or thoughts about our um, beloved Ruth Bader Ginsburg and her service as a, a, a prominent justice. Do you have any words for her or any thoughts? Wonderful career, courageous, honest, a lot of obstacles, uh, first woman on the Supreme Court, plenty of problems, stood up for justice all her life courageously. Uh, for the Republican Party, uh, there's the Senate is supposed to be a deliberative body under Mitch McConnell, who really is the evil genius of what's happening. Trump is a showman and a performer, but McConnell knows exactly what he's doing. He has converted the Senate into a joke. When Obama was elected, McConnell said straight out, the only thing we're going to do is try to block everything he might try to do. Yeah. When the Republicans gained a majority, all the Republicans Senate stopped any legislation, except for pouring money into the pockets of the rich. They did pass a tax bill to enrich the very rich in the corporate sector. They won legislative achievement. Other than that, they don't even look at legislative proposals. The one thing they do is try to stack the judiciary with young ultra-right lawyers who will be there for a generation and will be able to block any mildly progressive legislation, no matter what the public wants, no matter what the world needs. And you're seeing it very dramatically in the Ginsburg case. Under Obama, McConnell just refused to get the Senate to ratify any appointments. Uh, the most striking case was the Garland case. Uh, Obama picked a moderate centrist for the Supreme Court. Uh, they refused to consider it for a year. Wouldn't look at it. No, no, no confirmation uh, because they wanted to wait to hope that maybe they could get the presidency. As soon as they got the presidency, they started pouring in judicial nominations. Now it's right before an election. Twenty it, it, In Obama's case, uh, they made a big fuss about the fact that we can't appoint, can't allow an appointment. We have to let the next president appoint. Lindsey Graham, you know, the great statesman, uh, just outspoken about this. Now he's switched. When asked why, he said, the rules have changed. You know, now we can ram through an ultra-right uh, justice who will appeal to the evangelical base and help us, and uh, the right, and the ultra-nationalists and help us win the election. So let's ram it through. I mean, the hypocrisy is so stunning, you can't even find words for it. I mean, if this were happening in some you know, equatorial Guinea, for example, we'd be laughing at it. You know? yeah. But this is happening in the United States, yeah. and commentators are not laughing. I mean, in fact, a lot of them are supporting it, yeah. the right-wing commentators. Ross Tuart in the New York Times wrote a long, supposed to be the sensible conservative, wrote a long article saying, yes, this is right and just. You know, it's, uh, it's really amazing to watch. I mean, the country is falling apart. Mm -hmm. literally. It's, uh, and 
I mean, it's such a rich and powerful country that even Trump and his associates can't destroy it, at least soon, but they can certainly severely harm it. I mean, you can see the same with the, uh, take the conflict with China. There's a lot wrong with China, but uh, is that a reason to try to prevent China's development, especially in areas where it's more advanced than the United States? Hmm. Uh, which it is. In fact, like when Trump kicks out uh, all the Chinese students from American universities, he's kicking out the future of American science. I spent my all my life at MIT, greatest scientific institution in the world. You walk down the halls, you'd think you were in China. Half the students are Chinese. They used to stay here and contribute to American scientists. Now we'll block them. So American science will collapse. China will get the innovative, creative scientists. Fine. Let's do everything we can to try to prevent Chinese development and kill ourselves. Uh, China's way in the lead in sustainable energy production solar panels, electrification, uh, wind turbines, instead of cooperating with them and trying to deal with our own terrible climate crisis, let's try to block them, okay? That's the sensible thing to do. And pretending security concerns, which like TikTok, you have security concerns, WeChat, it's not even laughable, but uh, uh, we got to make sure that the world is subject to our hammer. If we want to smash them down, we'll do it. You just saw it this morning, if you probably didn't even notice yet. But the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, just declared that the United Nations sanctions against Iran are reinstituted. How can he do that? There were Security Council meetings in which the United States tried to ram this through. No support. I think uh, maybe Colombia supported it. The rest of the world opposed it. Okay, if Europe and the rest of the world opposes it, we'll just declare it. Yeah. We declare that the United Nations is imposing sanctions because that's us. See, we're the Mafia Don. Other people don't want, but like what we do, too bad. We'll smash them in the face, okay? Mm -hmm. Especially when they're weak and we can smash them. When they're strong, we stay away. We're cowards. We just attack the weak. Uh, but there are plenty of weak people there who we can attack and feel proud of, okay? Mm -hmm. From the Mayan highlands to uh, countries that are not going to stand up against us. Right. That's, that's the world. And if Trump either is elected or refuses to leave office, that might be what we're facing. Okay, now I know, thank you, Professor Chomsky. I have one more question. I know I have to let you go get busy with other agenda items. Um, you know, you mentioned, I was just thinking when you mentioned China and their scientists, their intellectual body that we, we you know, we get to get, have this as the United States when we have visitors from other nations like Germany was great with our technology uh, 70 years ago and helped develop things, um, some better than others, some not so great, uh, but they brought technology. I wanted to see if you could take a moment uh, and kind of reflect, you know, it's such a critical time. Like I'm talking to people in education, uh, pacifist type of people, people are speaking as if it's inevitable that uh, after November 3rd, there shall be violence. In some way, shape or form, after this election, there will be. I mean, these are people who you know, are anti-gun or just they don't even talk about it, educators. What words, what are your thoughts and words in terms of mentoring right now? We're, we, we have a generation that needs guidance, wisdom, understanding, overstanding. What, what, what is your words you could cast to the world and these young people who need your mm -hmm. wisdom and knowledge, 
as a trusted elder, not just an elder, but someone who's trusted, admired, and has a body of work that speaks for himself, please share just uh, the, the, the fabric and the importance of mentoring and what you give to the world as far as mentoring. Well, I think the best mentoring imaginable is the people whose names you don't know, but you know what they did. The people who were on the front lines in every major struggle, suffered, beaten, sometimes killed, remained nonviolent because that's what succeeds and did manage to make achievements. Uh, the young SNCC workers who were riding freedom buses in the South in 1960, 61, getting uh, to try to encourage terrified black farmers to dare to cast a vote, even though they might be lynched by raving white supremacists. Uh, John Lewis, for example, some of them you know, most you don't. Uh, the uh, people that went to Central America in the 1980s, tremendous movement. It did restrict the terror and violence. It was horrible enough, could have been worse. They were right there. You don't know their names. They're the important people. Same with Black Lives Matter. Uh, almost nobody name, knows the names of the activists who've been working all these years. We do know the names of the people who are undermining it. Uh, people who are going into white neighborhoods now to intimidate people, not to educate them, not to say, here's why you should join us, but come and say, you put a, a banner on your lawn or we're going to smash the place up. Okay, great gift to Trump. Couldn't love anything more. He might as well be paying them. Maybe he is. But uh, we have a long record of what works and what fails. What works is courageous, principled commitment to high ideals, including the ideal of nonviolent protest. You're not going to be patted on the back for it. You're not going to be given any gifts, but you'll win victories. And you'll work together with marvelous people, like the peasants in Santa Rita, who you mentioned at the beginning, or the people we've talked about since. Uh, uh, Archbishop Romero, Martin Luther King, uh, Father Aya Correa, many others, John Lewis, the names you know, and the countless others you don't know, who were right out in front. And that's where the mentoring ought to be. I don't have anything to say that begins to compare with them. Always oh, so humble. We appreciate you very much, Professor Chomsky, a real treasure to uh, m many people, including myself. And I thank you for your time and even going over time today. And I wish you a great day. And What's your dog's name? I hear her, him or her back there. I don't want to say it or she'll be racing to the door. G-U-S. <laughs> okay, okay. She doesn't know how to spell yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, well, I, I want to let you get to everybody else who wants your time today. Thank you again. And okay. we love you and appreciate you. Thank you. Nice yes, to be with you. Thank you. Nice to be with you. Peace.